folks, and welcome. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker, Professor James White, who is a fellow of the Institute for Arctic and Alpine Research at the University of Colorado at Boulder. When we were looking for a good speaker as part of our NSF Sustainability Grant, Professor White stood out as the obvious choice. Fortunately, we were able to arrange for him to visit and deliver two <coughs> lectures. Tonight's Sustainability, Climate Change, and You, and tomorrow evening's more technical talk, Ice Core Stories of Rough Climate Change and Future Sea Level. He is also visiting several classes tomorrow, as well as meeting with students and faculty. Dr. White earned his PhD in Geological Sciences from Columbia University in 1983. He currently holds three titles at CU, Professor of Geological Sciences, Director of the Environmental Studies Program, and Director of the Stable Isotope Lab within the Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research. Professor White's specific areas of research include modeling the global carbon cycle, development of techniques for measuring isotope ratios and atmospheric gases, reconstructions of paleo-environmental conditions, reconstructions of past environments, and tracing of groundwater flow and recharge. He has been a member of several deep ice boring projects in Greenland and Antarctica. His ice core research has helped to show that large climate changes tend to occur in the natural system as abrupt and rapid shifts rather than slow and gradual adjustments to changing external conditions. We're very fortunate to have him here with us tonight to talk to us about sustainability, climate change, and you, Dr. Wayne. Thank you very much, Chuck. Um, I thank you all for inviting me. I, that was an embarrassing and good uh, introduction. I, I didn't do all those things. Um, thank you very much, my, my, my dinner partner uh, over here. Um, where's Jake? Jake? Jake spent an hour and a half in the car today with Jake. It was really a, a great hour and a half. Um, I have his cell phone number if you been a little too shy to ask for Jake's cell phone. <laughs> I've got it. Okay, so, um, just ask afterwards. Is that okay, dude? Yeah. All right. All right, I gotta press a button on this thing to get the sucker to go. So, um, technology. There you go. Um, yeah, for PowerPoint. If you didn't know this. Crank up a PowerPoint presentation and then press W, the screen goes white. Crank it up and you press B, the screen goes black. All I have to do is press that same button again and it comes back. But you have to remember what button you press. <laughs> this I just found out. So uh, this evening I'd like to talk to you about sustainability and climate change. Climate change to me is a subset of sustainability. Sustainability is um, the challenge we have in providing uh, for a lot of people uh, living really high on the proverbial hog, uh, and we don't really know how to do that. But uh, climate change is one part of that problem. Because climate change, it turns out, is related back to energy, and energy is one of the real struggles we have in terms of providing for the future. Um, but I like to start with climate change because it is, uh, it's, it's a problem that we face right now. It is something we talk about today. Uh, it's very obvious. Uh, that this is a subject that's in the news, uh, and hopefully get a chance tomorrow to talk to some of the students about uh, what it's like to be a climate scientist and some of the fun parts and some of the not so fun parts. We're we'll talking about some of that this evening at dinner. So, what is our role and what is our responsibility? I'm going to come back to this word, this responsibility word here, because it's, I think it's a very important word. And uh, I don't tell this story very often. I think I'll tell it to this crowd. Um, I was invited once to give a talk at a um, um, the university in uh, Denver, uh, Colorado Christian University, and uh, it was pretty obvious at the beginning that it, this was a pretty fundamentalist place, and they were, um, they had invited someone from, um, I think it was the Heritage Foundation, or American Enterprise Institute or something, a, you know, a conservative think tank to come and speak. Uh, I was supposed to talk and they were supposed to talk. I told them I'm only going to debate these people. I did not work debating, uh, but I will come and talk. So that's what I did. So I, so I was the first to give my talk. So I, I gave a talk, I, parts of which you're going to see. Um, I have changed some of this stuff because it's a 
works. Why change it? Um, so anyway, I, at the, the, the last slide that I showed, and this is a big room, about 400 people, beautiful place. I'd say maybe out of 400 people, five people in the room were amenable to the message that I was giving. The other, you know, 395 were <laughs> amenable to the message. The other speaker was about to give, which is kind of changes the whole load of garbage and you should throw it out. So anyway, I'm cruising along, I give my talk, I end on the word responsibility. And I will do some of that to you today. I think responsibility is the key word. Um, I raised two kids. Tough word with them. It's a tough word with adults too. So when your parents, for those kids, when your parents give you grief about responsibility, give them grief right back. Because your parents' generation isn't doing a very good job of being responsible. So the word responsibility is the last slide. It's some big red letters across the screen. There's an AB switch from my computer to this other guy's computer. So they switch it from my computer to his computer. He starts giving his talk. The first slide is a whole bunch of climate changes and bonk and all this stuff. So he's cruising along and at the most inopportune time, for some reason, technology steps in and the word responsibility, my last slide, goes boom, right on the screen. <laughs> and I'm sitting down in the front row, so it's not me. Right? <laughs> And so the, the, he, he hits the A-B switch and gets back over to his computer. He didn't touch it, just happened. Uh, he still keeps talking. Five minutes later, responsibility. <laughs> now the irony is starting to get dripping as you follow my camera. <laughs> this has happened three or four times. The A-B guy got up and ended up just disconnecting my computer and getting it out of it in order to keep this from happening. Responsibility, that's the key word. So we'll come back. Um, I'm going to start with simple physics. Uh, I, I get asked a lot, is climate change real? Yes. Are human beings causing it? Yes. Do not equivocate. Do not give all sorts of maybes, this, that, and the other. Just say yes. Right. Now, the reason why we can say that is because basically, if you, if you just take a step back and you look at the planet as a whole and ask the question, uh, what controls climate on our planet, it turns out to be relatively simple. Actually, very simple. There are really only three things that control climate on our planet. How much energy we get from the sun, we're a sun-driven planet. There's energy that comes out of the ground, but you know, not a whole lot. Uh, how much of that energy gets reflected back to outer space? So this is not our planet. This is a planet that looks like our planet, but without any ice or snow. So today, there's lots of snow out there. Sun's energy comes in, bounces off. Planet. We would be, we're much colder here today than we would be if the snow had melted off. Right. And uh, meteorologists know this, weather forecasters know this, they know that once the snow falls, you can just drop the high temperatures uh, by a good 5, 10 degrees for the next few days until the snow melts off, if it ever melts off. <laughs> I am speaking to a crowd here in Minnesota. <laughs> How much of that energy gets reflected back to outer space? And third is the amount of greenhouse gas. Now, greenhouse gases are those gases that uh, do not absorb the sun's incoming energy. They absorb the energy that the Earth irradiates to outer space. And if you sat through introductory physics, you know that all bodies, except at zero degrees, and nothing is at zero degrees, radiates energy. It's, and it's related to your temperature. And so the Earth radiates in the infrared. And it's a different temperature. The Earth is clearly a different temperature than the sun. And if that's news to you, then we really do need to talk <laughs> later. Not just Jake's phone number. Um, here comes the sun's incoming energy, strikes the Earth, and it radiates in the infrared. So greenhouse gases are just happen to be those gases that absorb in the infrared. Water vapor, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, methane, gases like that. All gases, all molecules, fiber. All molecules, gaseous molecules, let's say I'm a carbon here in the middle and two oxygens, I vibrate. And if you give me the frequency of my vibration, I will absorb it. And if you don't give me the frequency of my, vib vib my vibration, I won't absorb it. My favorite example of that is being a, an older brother. My, my younger sister is two years younger than I am. Um, it was my job, my duty, my responsibility to torture her, <laughs> which I would do. And when she wanted to be pushed on the swing, if I was a good brother, I would push her at the right frequency, and she would go higher and higher, because she absorbed the energy I was pushing at the correct frequency. If I push her at any other frequency, she couldn't absorb it, and in fact, it annoyed her, which is more than likely what I did. But the important thing is that gases will absorb 
that energy that they want to absorb, that is their frequency. Now they also rotate and they translate and they do all those things. All right, but what we're interested in here is the vibrational energy. So those are just those greenhouse gases, just those gases that do that, special group of gases. So the Earth's temperature, you can take it, you can take our Earth's temperature by a number of methods, but if you drill up to the top of the atmosphere and you figure out how much energy are we getting from the sun, and what would our temperature be, given the amount of energy we're getting from the sun, we would be about negative 18 degrees Celsius. In order for us to be a warmer planet, we would have to be closer to the sun. So you'd have to get out the big engineering structures and move the planet closer to the sun in order to make it warmer. Now, I would argue that's too cold for advanced life. That's probably going to be frozen over oceans. Um, there probably would be life on the planet, but because uh, we still would have liquid water under that scenario. But, but you know, we wouldn't be here right, at negative 18 on average. The actual temperature of the planet, if you go out with a bunch of thermometers and measure, it's about plus 15 degrees Celsius. The different, and that's as I put up there, that's a nice temperature. It's cozy, not too hot at the equator. It's too cold at the poles, but you don't have to live at the poles. Um, and the difference between those two is because of greenhouse gases. The amount of energy we get from the sun will only get us to negative 18. We've got to add greenhouse gases to the atmosphere to get us up to plus 15. That's what greenhouse gases do for us. They raise the temperature of the Earth by about 33 degrees Celsius, 60 degrees Fahrenheit, and take us from a frozen world to a liquid world. Take us from a planet that probably wouldn't support us to a planet that clearly uh, does a wonderful job of supporting us. If we would do a wonderful job back, it would be even nicer. So, greenhouse gases are your friend. Greenhouse gases, uh, without them, we don't really have a habitable planet. So if we add lots of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, we will change climate. And climate is very simply defined as the energy in the lower atmosphere. And the distribution of that energy is the climate system. It can be uh, sensible heat, the heat that we sense, about 50% of the energy in the lower atmosphere is the energy that we sense. Uh, it can be about, it can be water evaporation, about 30% of the energy goes into water evaporation. It can be leaves moving. Uh, winds, in other words, it can be also photosynthesis. There's all sorts of ways in which energy is um, expressed in the lower atmosphere. But the expression of energy in the lower atmosphere is the climate system. So if we add greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, we will trap more of the Earth's outgoing radiation. We will increase the residence time of that energy in the lower atmosphere, and we will change climate. That is simple. That's simple physics. In order for that not to happen, molecules got to quit absorbing energy. So, simple physics. I give a little example um, in a class I teach on energy and environment where I try to get people to understand um, what it would take for us to add greenhouse gases to the atmosphere and not change climate. So I put a chair in front of me. We have a chair here. It's a pretty tall chair. I'm going to have somebody stand on this chair. A normal demonstration. So high. I should try it. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I have somebody stand on the chair, and uh, we, we talk about you know what, what would happen here if uh, we'll put Jim on. So Jim, you're you're not on the chair, but you're Thank mentally you. on the chair. Okay. This is a thought experiment. Thought experiment. You're mentally on the chair. So we put Jim mentally on the chair here, and we talk about what would happen if I walked over and I pushed. Jim. And I just saw Jim ride his bike back from. The restaurant. By the way, I really thank you for the wonderful walk. Um, Jim would probably be able to leap off, land deftly on both feet, and he wouldn't be hurt. So what do we do? We tie his ankles. So we tie Jim's ankles, and now we push. Him. Now he's you know still pretty deaf, so. I'm a little nervous about his ability to handle the situation, so we'll tie his hands behind his back. So we now got his feet tied. So this isn't a class full of 18 to 22 year olds, like you guys, you know, you know this. So we start talking about what's going to happen to Jim here, and we get into all sorts of stuff. You know, broken nose. You're wearing glasses. Oh my goodness. You know, shattered glasses. You know, stitches. You know, perhaps you know maybe even death. Really, quality, quality moments we have talking about Jim. And the students are free to, to you know, speak. I write on the board, you know, this is what's going to happen. It sounds like a, you know, an ER story by the time you get to the end. 
Not once in the 25 years I've taught that class, and not once in the multiple times I've given a public lecture, has anybody raised their hand and seriously said, Jim won't fall. Today, gravity does not apply to Jim. Now think about that. We all know how absurd it is that Jim won't fall. We know physics is physics. We know you cannot deny that. We know you cannot pass a law against gravity. If we could, Congress would pass a law reducing the gravitational constant by 10%, we'd all lose 10, 20, 30 pounds in a heartbeat. Right? <laughs> you can't do it. We know that to be the case. You can no more deny the, the reality of gravity than you can deny the reality that molecules, when they vibrate, are going to absorb energy. So this is simple physics. And when somebody says to you, is climate changing? That's an easy one, because that's just reading a thermometer record. Are human beings causing it? Yes, because we put greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, large amounts of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and that will change climate. You don't have to get any more complicated than that. It doesn't take a whole bunch of complicated models. It doesn't take a whole bunch of, of complicated arguments. It is that simple. Right. So the real question then is, so what? What are you going to do about that? What are the implications? What are the ramifications? What's the economics? What are the ethics? What are the morals behind it? So the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the, the ramifications of climate change, we'll talk a lot, hopefully, about the other aspects of this, the economic side, the, the uh, moral side, the ethical side. Because these, this is where it gets really interesting. So we live on a, it's a relatively simple planet when it comes to the relationship between temperature and sea level. I'm a paleoclimatologist, and when I look at <coughs> the history of the planet in terms of its temperature and the history of the planet in terms of sea level, this is one of the most robust relationships we have on the planet. And it's because, again, simple physics reigns. When our planet warms, sea level rises. When our planet cools, sea level drops because of two things. Number one, thermal expansion of water. Can't get around it. When you warm water up, it expands. When you warm the ocean up, it expands and sea level rises. The other thing that happens is when you warm up the air and when you warm up water, you melt land ice. And tomorrow night, I'll talk more about that. But tonight, very, very straightforward. Right? You warm up the air, you will warm up the water, you warm up the water, both of those things start to melt land ice. Land ice goes in the ocean and raises sea level. And again, sea level and temperature is one of the most robust relationships we have on the planet. So we can expect sea level to rise. It is rising today. It will continue to rise in the future. And it's not by small amounts. If you come tomorrow, we'll talk about the history of sea level, but we live on a planet where sea level goes up and down by large amounts. 20,000 years ago, sea level was more than 300 feet lower than today. Russia and the U.S. were connected via Alaska. Sarah got it right at that point. Um, Indonesia was connected to Australia. So, different looking world at that point, 300 feet lower. Sea level has been much higher in the Sea level's been uh, 50, 60, 70, 80 feet higher than today. And we just happen to have populated and uh, industrialized the planet at a time when sea level has been pretty constant. And so when we built big cities on the coast, because this reports were, and we populated the planet by ship, we ended up, we thought, uh huh, sea level's level. And indeed, it's not. It goes up and down. Sea level estimates by the end of this century are about three feet higher. That's conservative. And again, we'll talk about this more tomorrow, but it could be higher than that, probably not huge amounts. But what does three feet look like? This is what three feet looks like in the city of Miami. This is no longer a city that functions. This is a city in which the power lines are in trouble. This is a city in which the gas lines are in trouble. This is a city in which the sewer lines are in trouble. This is a city in which the infrastructure doesn't work anymore. And, it's, and, and this is the key to, to big cities, the infrastructure. The goods and the, the services that you're delivered and the services that you give back to the system. Uh, I, I asked my class, for example, what's the, what's the physics behind the flush toilet? Gravity. 
gravity. Without gravity, it goes downhill, folks. Right? <laughs> the bottom of the, the gradient here is coming up on. The, the flush toilet does not work so well in this system anymore. Okay. So when the, when the flush toilet doesn't work so well anymore, and when you don't have electricity, you don't have gas and other things, this is not a city that's going to function. It's not going to stop there. Uh, this is Miami with six feet of sea level rise. Um, this is, you know, this is a city that you go visit in, in a glass bottle boat. This is a city where you go fishing. This can be really good fishing down here. This, you know, this is artificial reefs like nobody's business. Right? So, and, so, and, and you might chuckle, but this is reality. In a hundred years or so, your, your grandkids, your great grandkids are going to go bone fishing down here because it's going to be fantastic, assuming we clean up the buildings before we turn these. <laughs> now, Miami's not alone in this. There's a whole bunch of cities that are problematic around the coast. Um, and we'll talk, again, we'll talk more about sea level rise tomorrow. Uh, why do I pick on Miami? I pick on Miami for a very simple reason. Um, <clears throat> number one, it, it's a, um, this is a city that is built on sand and coral, both of which can't stop water. Basically, water goes right through. So you could build all the dikes around Miami you want. You won't stop it. Uh, the water will come up underneath your feet. You'd have to basically build a dike and then concrete over Miami, at which point you go, why am I here? <laughs> I've done a whole lot of engineering to stay in a spot that God does not want me to stay in. All right. There's more simple physics. Um, warmer air holds more water. So we expect there to be more precipitation globally in the future. Now, ironically, also, warmer air evaporates more water from the surface, which dries the land. So the key to keeping a continent nice and moist is to have plants. And if you dry out a continent to the point where the, the plants turn brown and dry up, like you said, the Great Plains where I just came from, then things can get very dry and things can get very hot. We know this is a whole bunch of good examples. How many people saw the PBS special on the Dust Bowl? Was that depressing? Wow. That was six hours. Was it six hours? Felt like 20. A really good television, but very, very depressing. And I mean, what, what folks did at that time, farmers um, were, they, they, wheat prices were falling. And, in, and when wheat prices are falling, what did they do? They figure, all right, if I make a certain amount of money on an acre of wheat, I'll plant two acres of wheat. That'll give me the same amount of money if, if wheat prices drop by 50%. So, I mean, for those of you who have taken economics, you know this is not going to end well. And it didn't end well. And basically, they plowed up a lot of the prairie, took away a lot of the ability for moisture to come from the land <coughs> into the atmosphere and keep things cool. And uh, numerous modeling studies since then have shown that the severity of the Dust Bowl years <coughs> were increased dramatically by the fact that we plowed out the vegetation. We took away that feedback, that ability for the land to feed water to the atmosphere. Another thing that happens on a warmer planet, and we don't have time to go into this, but basically the, the large-scale circulation of the atmosphere changes. So we, the big cell where you evaporate water along the equator and it flows north and falls about 30 degrees north today, that big Hadley cell that circulates and chunks, chugs away and brings moisture from the tropics up towards the uh, temperate region, that's, that gets bigger. And for us, what that means is that the dry zone, so I'll back up for a second, so think about it, so if you have moisture rising at the equator and it starts to go north, it's, once it's risen in the atmosphere, it's squeezed out most of its moisture, so dry air falls at about 30 degrees north. If you <coughs> take a map of the world and you take 30 degrees north across, you'll find the Sahara, you'll find West Texas, you'll find Mexico, you'll find a whole bunch of deserts stretch around, and that's in part because of this large-scale circulation in the atmosphere. So what we're predicting is that that cell will grow, and what that means is if you're at 35, 40 degrees north, like we are in Boulder, we see New Mexico basically coming up towards us, and New Mexico is pretty dry. That also means that uh, if you go a little bit farther north, it actually gets wetter right, for the same basic reason. Now, I was about to say, so the bottom line is, what does the past tell us? I actually reread this. I don't recommend it. How many people had to read Samuel 
Taylor. Okay. Let's commiserate afterwards. Right. <laughs> the U.S. is warming. All right. So the this is a, a uh, this happens to be Colorado uh, from 16 general circulation models. But in black here you see this. So continental regions are warming up. So we can expect continental regions some ways to dry out and in, in total actually globally to get wetter. Oh, by the way, Jeff Lucas, the Western Water Assessment, I give a lot of credit to Stephen Cope his slides. So the U.S. is warming up. And as I was telling you, the, uh, these large-scale circulation systems, basically, uh, the models generally agree that the uh, uh, drier parts move north and get drier. Here's the summertime drying out of the whole continental United States, spring, winter, fall. And the wetter parts, you guys are actually Sitting up here, you get a, in almost all the models, you get wetter in the spring and in the um, winter, but you dry out in the summertime. For the same basic reason we all dry out here, because once this continent starts to dry out, then everything is out. Now, I threw this slide in because I, I, I'm sitting on a committee now where we're actually revisiting the issue of abrupt climate change and we're working hard to try to understand where are the thresholds in our climate system. And as continental regions uh, warm up and dry out, one can ask the question, okay, what about food? You know, what, can we continue to grow the crops that we've been growing? And so we've been talking to a whole bunch of experts on food, and they, they, those experts tell us that um, when we have droughts, we have two adaptations to deal with that from a food point of view. One is to stockpile food. <clears throat> so, if you're, if you're a farmer or if you're a, a co-op or if you're a government, you stockpile grains. And so when you have a drought, you can bring those stockpile grains back into the market and you keep people fed and you keep the price from going up through the, through the roof. That's strategy number one. Strategy number two is you pump water out of the ground. And, that, and strategy number two is by far the most used strategy globally. So when the southeast, for example, has a drought, which the southeast has been in a drought numerous times in the last 10 or 15 years, the adaptation is to pump water out of the ground. We've quit stockpiling food here in the U.S. Uh, some time ago. We're screwed in the same sort of just-in-time mentality that we have in manufacturing we have in food. When I was a kid, I don't know, when I was a kid, we used to have you know, stockpile cheese and stockpile all sorts of stuff and it would show up in the supermarket one day. It wasn't very good. But it was, you know, stockpile. I, we don't do that anymore. <clears throat> Interestingly, um, what's happening is we're approaching, in many parts of the world, an interesting threshold, an interesting tipping point, where we won't be able to take water out of the ground anymore to backstop us from droughts, because the ground is no, no more completely full of water than it is full of oil or natural gas or anything like that. Okay. This was a, a fascinating figure that they showed us. This is a, uh, a map of the planet from a gravity point of view. And it turns out that the big difference in gravity that you see on land is how much water is in the ground. The more water is in the ground, the more mass is there, the more gravity there is, the more you weigh, unfortunately. Um, but what's been happening, in the red areas here, you see a depletion of groundwater over the past uh, 10 years. Also in the ice areas, you see a depletion of ice, by the way. But you'll notice here, the southeast has been pumping water for the last 10 years. And you see in red here the decrease, centimeters per year, the decrease in the groundwater aquifer. This is an unsustainable situation. As this area continues to have, basically what's happening here is that this area is taking money out of its bank, taking water out of its bank account. And this is an unsustainable situation because eventually you come <coughs> to the point where you can't get the water out anymore and you're going to have to. Now note that there are some areas, you see farther north here, where you're starting to see, where you see an increase in precipitation and an increase in groundwater recharge. But unfortunately, uh, we grow most of our food here in the, the red areas here. Russia is, is looking at some big problems here. The Indian groundwater depletion is here. We can go on and on about this. But basically that message of where it's dry, if, if, if it dries just to the south, south of you, it's going to creep up on you. Uh, a little bit about the U.S. heartland drought, the recent drought. Um, this was, as you, you, you all know, uh, a record drought in terms of many uh, categories here. Um, so I was talking to Jeff Lucas about this at the Western Water Assessment, and he goes, yeah, it was pretty rare. This was a pretty rare drought. And um, 
That's good news, bad news. The good news is, since it's a rare drought, you might say, okay, maybe this won't happen again. The bad news is, well, maybe, you know, if we're pushing into a new climate regime, maybe this is something that's going to happen more often. So, just some, some indices here. This is something called the Palmer Drought Severity Index, where you, it just basically showed the U.S. in 2012 in the summertime was a dry, dry, dry place. Now, how, how can we determine what it was like in the past? Um, I have to give props to my tree ring folks. Uh, this is a uh, plot of percent area that has drought from 1900 to 2010, showing what we observed and what the tree rings reconstructed. And they do a pretty good job. So going in and coring trees across this area, people like Ed Cook and others put together these tree ring indices, and they can do a very good job of saying, yep, the trees are going to tell us what drought is. So then you can say, well, how far back in time can the trees go? And this is the answer. We can take it back to about 1,000 AD. And here we have the same plot where about 60%, this is the 2012 observed level here. And you see that 2012 was indeed rare. In the last 1,000 years, maybe 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. 13 out of 1,000 years were like 2012. So if that is a sign of things to come, which is the climate scientists are telling us, then this is not good news. If this was just a random shot, cling to that. Interestingly, there are a number of uh, ways that we can see this has occurred in the past. This is, uh, you, actually I flew over this today. Um, if you fly from Denver to Chicago or Denver to Minneapolis, you fly over uh, a good chunk of Nebraska here, which is the sand hills. When a lot, when settlers were coming across the United States, the European settlers, they found areas of this that they called the Great Sahara. It was basically sand. At that time, there was, it was a bit drier, and the dunes were activated. And this area has been activated in the past. This whole area was one big sand dune, basically, about 1,000 years ago. Also activated about 500 years ago. And it's activated many times in the past. We live, the U.S. Cent central United States lives on a, a, a pretty much a borderline between you know, grassland and sand dunes. Right? So it's... Again, the, the, the message, the reinforcing message is you've got to watch out for that, uh, for those plants. Those plants are absolutely critical. When they dry up, when they blow away, the whole system can go to something. Uh, just a, a little bit about sea ice. I want to say something about that because this is something we've been working on quite a bit lately. This is actually a movie. So what I'm going to show you is a movie of uh, Arctic sea ice. And what's interesting about this is that we've now gotten sophisticated enough that we can, in white, tell you old sea ice from, in dark blue, young sea ice. This is all sea ice, even the dark blue stuff. But the dark blue stuff is about one year ice, and the lighter ice is, is multi-year ice. Now, it used to be that this area was cold enough that multi-year ice build up all the time. Um, and what you'll see here as time goes by is well, this is actually all these icebergs get flooded. You can also see how the Arctic circulates, by the way. So ice is constantly flushing out here along the coast of Greenland. This is what sunk the Titanic, by the way, a long time ago. Watch 2007. 2006. 2007 was a banner year. A lot of the old ice got flushed out by a threshold type event. It was a meteorological event that kicked in. So here we are in 2012. Now mentally compare what this to what I started with, which was this was all white. So we've now gone from a system, an Arctic system, that had multi-year ice that would not melt out in the summertime to a system that has one-year ice that pretty much can melt out to maybe like 70-80% now in the summertime. <coughs> For years, already people have been sailing ships along here. The Russians charge a fortune for sailing through their waters. So companies are waiting to be able to sail across here, now, and that's becoming reality. It's cheaper. Cheaper distance-wise, and you don't have to pay the Russians anything. If, from a climate point of view, this is interesting because you go from um, blue, you go from white ice, unfortunately, bad color choice here, white ice to blue water very quickly. And remember that second thing that controls global climate is the amount of reflectivity of the planet. So when you go from white ice, which reflects the energy back to outer space and keeps you cold, to blue ocean that absorbs that energy, you fundamentally change 
the climate of the Arctic. And we can now, we're set up to be able to, to do this every year, because we're basically down to one year ice. And you, you folks here in Minnesota, you know very well, <laughs> lakes will freeze over, very large lakes can freeze over, and in a relatively short period of time can melt out. As a matter of fact, uh, Lake Erie, we did a study once of Lake Erie. Lake Erie is about the size of eastern Colorado, which is a pretty large chunk of land. Uh, and Lake Erie historically would go from total 100% ice cover to 0% ice cover in a short time. Anybody care to guess how quick that was? You folks should know, you live in ice country. <laughs> how quickly can Lake Erie go from 100% ice to 0% ice? A weeks. A couple weeks, yeah. When I ask that question at Coloradans, they go, I don't know, a year? <laughs> Come on, dude, pay attention here. Let's try this again, all right? You know that, that typical ice app can happen very, very quickly because you get melting from the top, you get melting from the bottom, and you get wind coming along, stirring it up, and you can go from it. Ice covered and no ice in a matter of 10 days, two weeks, something like that. So there's a whole bunch of far-ranging impacts that come from this. Right? There's something called the Arctic Paradox. Have we heard of this? Has this made the news yet, Arctic Paradox? So the Arctic Paradox basically says that um, the way that, the way that uh, uh, climate works on our planet is you've got warm tropics and you've got cold poles. And when you do that, you've got a whole bunch of energy that wants to go from the equator to the pole because nature does not like it being cold in that side of the room and warm in that side of the room. So there's going to be motion, air motion, in order to try to balance that out. And that's what happens on our planet. You get lots of heat flowing north all the time. Um, things like the jet stream happen because of, because we live on a spinning planet, then you end up with things like the jet stream that go circulating around. And the colder the poles is and the warmer the equator is, the stronger the jet stream is and the straighter the jet stream is. So like, like a mountain stream, it comes flowing out of the Colorado Rockies. Um, they're straight and, they're, and they're, they're fast. When they hit the plains, the energy starts to make them meander and wander. So what's happening to our jet stream today is that instead of being strong and going around in circles, it's beginning to slow down and meander more. And ironically, meanders means that you can bring cold air down farther south than you used to. So we've got a nice dose of cold air right now. Now I don't know whether that cold air is there because the Arctic is warmer than it used to be or not. But that's the general pattern you can expect in the future. That you're going to get these interesting paradoxes where yes, the whole, overall the climate's warming up, but we get more of these cold air incursions coming in. And they stay longer because the jet stream is moodier and slower and storms move more slowly and all sorts of things. So all sorts of other things that happen in an ice free Arctic there's politics. Um, the Russians planted a flag at the bottom of the North Pole. Yeah, it's the bottom of the North Pole, it's the bottom of the ocean. Right? So it's the top of the world, the bottom of the North Pole. Why? I don't know. Right, it's politics. Like, I understand politics. Um, there's more ships. Uh, Shell tried really hard to um, build a uh, oil and gas extraction system out in the Arctic Ocean this year. They got beat up, had to retreat, but you'll see more of that. You'll see more resource extraction, you see more ships like that. And one of the more interesting problems here, and something that I have studied is, um, there's a lot of carbon up there. There's as much carbon in permafrost, frozen soils, as there is in all coal, oil, and natural gas. And there's even more carbon in what's something called methane clathrates, which are frozen methane ices, than there is in all coal, oil, and natural gas. This is a map of permafrost showing you the permafrost regions of the world. There's a lot of carbon up there, and it's warming up. And that carbon will melt and it will come out into the atmosphere. Now, fortunately, we don't think this is going to come out rapidly, like in 20, 30, 40 years. It'll come out over hundreds of years. But this is a big positive feedback. And it has big policy implications because as we think about, finally, what are we going to do about greenhouse gases and, and what are we going to do about fossil fuel emissions, by the time we actually get around to this, we're already starting to see carbon come out of permafrost. By the time we get around to this, the, the permafrost is putting carbon in the atmosphere and just sort of chuckling, you know, as we try to ramp back our carbon emissions, nature starts to pump carbon emissions in the atmosphere. Hopefully it won't be that ironic. Hopefully it won't be that, you know, 
nasty of a situation, but that is exactly where we're heading right now. We're already starting to see signs that uh, this carbon is beginning to decay, warm up, thaw out, decay, and come into the atmosphere. A lot of it is up. Okay, let's go off in a different direction. This is a hard problem. It's going to take many of us to solve it. Why is it hard? Well, it's political. No getting around that. It is political. Number two, there's a lot of money at stake. We spend about one and a half trillion dollars a year on energy in this country. And it's about 85% coal, oil, and natural gas. So there's well over a trillion dollars a year that's going into the fossil fuel industry. Now, you know, and, and I'm not, thank you, oil, coal, and natural gas, because we wouldn't have the lights on in this room. We wouldn't be doing what we're doing in here. We wouldn't have the heat, we all this other stuff. Thank you, right? But, all right, also know the way that our political system works is when you got the money, you hire the lobbyists. Right? So it shouldn't be a surprise that climate scientists get beat up on a regular basis. I don't think it's a surprise at all. I think it's a natural outcome of the way the system is set up in our country. It's just the way it is. It's also hard because the problem is global. It doesn't matter whether we produce the carbon dioxide or whether China produces the carbon dioxide or whether India does it or Brazil or Europe. It all goes into a common atmosphere. Which is why I say climate change is training wheels for sustainability. If we can actually solve the issue of climate change, we will have solved the, the problem of how do we get a whole bunch of individual nations together to solve a common problem. If we can figure out how to do that, get a whole bunch of nations together to figure to solve a common problem, we will have taken a huge step for solving a whole bunch of other problems like food and water and population and mineral resources and really stuff that gets much gnarlier and nastier than climate change. Um, right now it's about economics. Uh, in the great decision bus of life, the, the economists are driving. And you can see that. This is a plot that shows the fossil fuel carbon dioxide emissions versus time. It goes up. Uh, we burn more carbon dioxide, burn more fossil fuels produced more carbon dioxide today than we have in any other year in the past. So we haven't, you know, what we're talking about is basically trying to turn the corner, bring this down here. We haven't even turned the corner now. Now note that the only times on here where things have slowed down are economic. The oil crisis is OPEC. OPEC's formed, they decide, hey, we're going to try to control prices. The, the United States, Europe, everybody goes, hey, can't do that. My dad who used to drive an old mobile that a family of 12 could live in, <laughs> bought a Volkswagen. And it's like, dad bought a Volkswagen. That was a crisis. U.S. savings and loan crisis does not get enough credit for being a big economic hit. Any of the economists know. This is the, this is, I, I went to Florida State University, this is when we collapsed, that's no, actually former Soviet Union, <laughs> Asian financial crisis, and interestingly, look at, the, the rules changed somewhere in here. Note that the pace of this increases, this is China and India beginning to ramp in as industrial powers over the last 10 years or so. And note that the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, which still lingers with us, did not really bother the system for more than a year. Went down by one year, and then back up we go. And that's China, that's India, that's Brazil, that's other countries of the world continuing to perk along while in what we used to call the industrialized world tries to deal with the situation. Grow is what we do. Uh, I'm going to skip that. Um, it's also a problem because, because we live on a water planet. Now, it's, I think we all know this, 70% of the surface out there is water, right? and this is an easy, I, I have my class do this experiment. You know, you take two identical pots, you put it on the stove, you put water in one, you both put water in the other, you turn the heat on exactly the same amount, you wait a certain period of time, and then you take the temperature of the bottom of the pot, or the, what's in the pot, and don't try this at home. Uh, the, the pot without any water, you'll scorch your finger on because metal's heating up very quickly. The pot with the water on it, even after five minutes or so, that water hasn't changed temperature very much at all. Right? We've all done this. 
I watch pot never boils, classic. Just, you know, it takes a long time. And what's happening here is water has a large heat capacity. It takes a lot of energy to pump into water to get the water warm. That's what's happening on our planet today. We put greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The atmosphere is warming up. The atmosphere warms the ocean, and the ocean's basically slowing it down. So the ocean's always going to keep us about 50 to 70 years behind what the atmosphere wants us to be because we live on a water planet. As long as we keep putting more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the ocean will keep slowing us down. Cause and effect are not immediate. It's hard to get action when you don't have cause and effect. And this creates a classic intergenerational problem. My generation is handing off to you guys a problem that we've already put in the atmosphere today. And tomorrow night we'll talk about how big that problem That's a big problem already. But it hasn't expressed itself because the oceans haven't warmed up yet. Now the flip side is just as bad, by the way. Right? So imagine now you've got a pot of boiling water and a pot of very hot air, a very hot pot. Turn the heat off. Within a relatively short period of time, the pot on the right, my right, cools off. On the left, with the boiling water, stays hot for a long period of time. So even if we start to try to cool the planet off by taking greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere or by reducing our emissions to the atmosphere, the ocean says, uh-uh, you've already warmed me up. You've actually already banked a whole bunch of carbon in the ocean. That's another story. But you've already warmed me up, so it's going to stay warm longer than you would like. So adaptation and mitigation are two words we hear a lot of. Um, it's not just about energy. You're going to have to adapt. Um, methane and nitrous oxide are basically food greenhouse gases. Methane is produced by ruminants, cattle belching away, uh, produced by rice cultivation. Nitrous oxide is produced because we fertilize to grow food, and fertilizer is food for bacteria that when they eat that fertilizer, they produce nitrous oxide. Both of these are very strong greenhouse gases. Both of them are on the rise. Together, they're equal to about 60% of CO2. So even if we weren't burning fossil fuels and producing CO2 to the atmosphere, we would still have a greenhouse gas impact because of food production. We have alternates to energy. And we're trying, believe me, to have alternates to food, but we haven't gotten there yet. On the other hand, don't go silently into the night. Right? Don't just say, ah, it's all horrible. We can't fix this. We're smart. We're resourceful. And we are fundamentally good. Right? This is sort of like self-affirmation time. We are smart, we're resourceful, and we're fundamentally good. Those are three great things. Right? We can do a whole lot better than this creature right here. Burying our head in the sand and saying, no, this isn't happening. Because where is this creature going to get shot? <laughs> <laughs> is it surprising that human beings are causing climate change? No. This is really the key to sustainability. We have, I've just told you for the last, I don't know how many minutes, we've altered the Earth's energy balance and changed climate. But we also do all sorts of things that are big, 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 big on the planet. We move 10 times more dirt through mining activities and uh, building shop malls, stuff like that, than all natural processes. If you add up all the mud, dirt flowing through the rivers and through atmosphere every year, we move 10 times more dirt than nature does every year. I'm impressed by that. Usually. This is my favorite. We live on a planet that feeds us and gives us oxygen because of photosynthesis. Because green plants take carbon dioxide, water, nutrients, forgetting one. Carbon dioxide, water, nutrients, sunlight. Thank you very much. And sunlight, and make sugars, and by the way, make oxygen, and feed the world. Where do plants get the nutrients? Some of it comes out of the ground by weathering, but nitrogen, a very important nutrient, has to be taken from the atmosphere as nitrogen and made into ammonia and nitrate by bacteria. So without those bacteria working away every day, taking nitrogen out of the atmosphere and making nitrate ammonia, green plants don't exist and we don't exist. In about 50 short years, we went from not even being a part of the nitrogen cycle on the planet to the point we're at today, we make more nitrogen fertilizer than all of the bacteria on land. And we're very, very close to making more nitrogen fertilizer than all the bacteria, period, on the planet. That is huge. In less than one generation, we go from nothing to running the show. Right? You can make the same argument about a whole bunch of other things. How is all this possible? 
two very important factors. One is there's a lot of us. We are here. We are going this direction up here. All right? And that's a very important curve. Getting people to understand the exponential curve is not an easy thing to do. But this is a very, very important curve. The other big part to this is, however, uh, what I call the nasty dilemma. Um, this is the amount of energy per capita used in various countries. This could also be water, this could be calories, this could be the uh, amount of lithium used in batteries, a whole bunch of other things. You get about the same plot. <clears throat> There's a certain amount of energy that's required to run a show if you're going to have an industrialized society like Austria, France, UK. We're up here, but that's a whole different story. Uh, look where, this is an old plot, so China's actually up here closer to the world average, but I like the colors, so I use this one. India's still down around here so much. This is where a lot of the world is. Here's the world average down here. So you've basically got a whole bunch of people out there. India, uh, China's a good example. China's got 1.2 billion people, about 300 million of which live like we do, about 900 million of which want to live like we do. Today, China already produces more CO2 than we do. China uses more energy than we do. Um, I, this one kills me. China consumes half of the world's bacon. <laughs> bacon. 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 I'm, I'm, I'm a huge bacon fan. Right? I worry about the price of bacon. If China's allowed to, you know, yank the front, I mean, this is scary stuff. <laughs> that 300 million, there's another 900 million sitting around going, I want to be like that 300 million. If they get there, it's not a factor of, you know, 10, 20, 30 percent. It's a factor of five times increase for China to get to Europe, eight times increase for India to get to Europe. And you've got to multiply those by two to get to where we are today. So these are huge increases in the amount of energy we need, in the amount of water we need, in the amount of bacon we need. So these are fundamental, fundamental problems. Uh, just a few, I'm sorry, I'm running over time. Uh, scientists knew this was coming a long time ago, said so. The world has done a little about it. Uh, I laid part of that problem at the feet of climate scientists. What I said at the beginning of my talk, human beings are causing climate change. Yes. Period. 20 years ago, I couldn't get a climate scientist to say that. You'd get a whole lecture, two or three hours of lecture. Um, about 20 to 25 percent of all fossil fuels ever burned were burned since the, the only time we've actually tried to do anything about it was the Kyoto Protocol. That's that power of the exponential. About a quarter of all fossil fuels ever burned were burned since 1997. You guys, under, how old are you? 21. 21. What year were you born? 1991. 1991. You were alive in 1997. You're part of this. Okay? You don't get a free ride throughout the entire lecture. <laughs> I don't think I need to, to go off here. I'd, I'd love to talk about the fact that I think education in this country is under attack. Um, I think what you guys are doing here is fantastic. Keep doing it. Um, an educated populace is our best defense against the ignorance which really drives um, the folks who would like to tell you the climate change is uh, so keep educated. It is our responsibility, and uh, sustainability, as I, as I said before, is the big problem. It's not just a question of climate change. Every problem we face is a step towards sustainability, and we've got to face these things successfully. We've got to recognize we have a problem, deal with it, and move on to the more adult <coughs> questions. So, I want to end with this. What I told you for the last, I'm sorry, too much time, uh, is, is not terribly uplifting. <clears throat> Unless anybody here wants to argue with me and says, no, that's fun. I don't know how bad this can actually get, huh? I'm going to tell you three things that make this actually a really uplifting story. And it has to do with my, th my three simple rules of sustainability. Number one, everything must cycle. You can't go throwing stuff away. Right, you got to cycle stuff and bring it back in the system because eventually you're going to, anything you throw away, eventually you're going to go back to the garbage heap to find it, to, to get more of it, right? because otherwise you're going to run out of it. Second, population must be controlled. The number one factor for population control on our planet is the value of women in society. 
If women have value, economic value, if they have societal value, if they have political value, they have less children per woman than they do if they do not have that value. So the number one way to control population is for men to treat women better on this planet. And we have a very, very bad situation on the planet. You know, we in the U.S., we sort of say, okay, you know, we're okay. We're not like Africa where it's really bad, right? And then I, then I like to ask my class the question, okay, fine. Name the first female president of the United States. I will actually get people raising their hands. No. My third is equity must be considered and acted upon. You can't have two billion people living high on the hog eating bacon all the time and five billion people not. Because a couple of billion people are starving. And they will get what they, they will do whatever they can do to get food, to get water. They'll cut the trees down. They don't care about the environment. They care about feeding their kids. They care about survival. Right? You cannot run a planet that way. Everybody's got to have a minimum level of uh, participation in the economic growth of the world, or else you're going to have people outside the system and they are not going to care. So you've got to have some level of equity. Now the third, so I've mentioned two things about equity here. Uh, sexual e equity and uh, rich poor equity. The third one is the one I already mentioned, and that is intergenerational equity. If one generation values its children more, then you start to address this problem of the water problem, the 50-year lag time that we have on the planet. All right. so, if you're following home here, if you're following the, uh, the home game, there are three things that we can do to help address the issue of sustainability. Number one, men treat women better. Number two, rich treat the poor better. Number three, one generation treat the next generation better. I can't see anything wrong with either with any of those three things. I think doing those three things makes us better people. I think doing those three things makes us a better society. And just think about it. If we, to get to sustainability, had to be real jerks, that'd be tough. But indeed, we just have to be nice. We have to be better to each other. We have to be nicer people. And I can't think of a more uplifting message on which to end this lecture than that. Thank you all for listening. Questions? Yeah. Um. I didn't say anything controversial here. So. No, it's, it's, it's just a thing that I mean, um, um, I'm a Christian, I love God, and I'm surprised, first off, that why would anybody be unamenable to that message? Because that's like ah. three things that are... Politics. I just don't understand how you could do that and be like, nah. <laughs> no, I think it's politics. Yeah, yeah no, I, we can have a whole discussion of this, but... It, uh, you know, for example, um, just recently, uh, the uh, um, a whole bunch of fundamentalist groups uh, decided that immigration was something that they wanted to tackle. That it was not right to have a whole bunch of Hispanic and poor folks who were off, you know, and weren't being taken care of, and and were in poverty, and uh, were being shoved out of the system, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Those Hispanics have been there for a long time. Right? They were there 10 years ago when that same group was saying, no, we don't want to have anything to do with this. Place. So their morals, their ethics, their religious values did not change, I think, between then and now. So what did change? Politics. Right? You saw what happened in the last election. You can't win an election in this country without reaching out to minorities. I hate to, so what I'm telling you is a real bubble burster, right? So, you know, it's not just about what you believe, it's how you express that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about population, so I'm going to jump in on that right away when I first comment the question. <laughs> Have you ever seen uh, Numbers USA, Boy Banks, Dumbball demonstration with population? No. 
Uh, he did a new one, but it's really, really interesting because he, he, he tries to stay out of the politics, but he, in simple mathematics, demonstrates how little will the hood comes to population. And with that also, you're talking about equity and relationships. I want to say that, that in the U.S., we've been a very sexist uh, nation in terms of uh, we say we have women's rights, but when you look at relationships, whose responsibility is it for birth control? The women. You give them the pill, hey, we liberated them. I want to challenge all the college students here to start rethinking that. In a relationship, shouldn't it be the male responsibility as much as the female or more so? But see, we let, we let the men get off free hand because there's no risk, no risk of pregnancy. I did not expect this question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That comment, but yeah, I, I like your population. <laughs> no other questions? Yeah. Uh, in Garrett Hardin's strategy, the comments yeah. kind of outlines a bunch of different ways to tackle sustainability problems, uh, like two of which being like legislating temperance or using government to uh, sort of regulate people's actions, and then also privatization so people feel like they have a bigger stake in the problems at hand. Yeah. So, how would you uh, basically enforce these, the three rules of sustainability? What would be your favorite? No, I, I, I do think we have to have common ownership of, of common goods. Um, and I think we have to have cradle to grave mentality. You can't take coal out of the ground, burn it, put CO2 in the atmosphere, and leave it there and think you've done your thing. Right? That, car, that CO2 has got to cycle back to the ground in order for that cycle to be complete, or you have to pay for what you've done to the commons. So I think we have to have very much more a common mentality. You can't just, there, there is no else out there. Right? there. There is no other place where your waste can go. Uh, it is our air, it is our water, it is our planet. And uh, also in, in like a, after that, there are a lot of cultures around the world that believe that their resources uh, fall under their right to culture. Mm -hmm. So I was asking if you were giving this lecture to say a culture from India or parts of Africa that believe that yeah, part of their either spiritual beliefs or cultural beliefs that they need to have as many children as possible to let, uh, let their family name live on. Like how would you convince them that I don't know, because like, when you think about like, the population conference of the 70s and 80s, mm -hmm. a lot of people of uh, formerly colonized nations believe this was just another attempt for the West essentially to uh, uh, sort of restart imperialism on uh, marginalized nations. How, how would you uh, sort of change them or talk to them about this issue? Well, you know, if, if I anticipated that issue to come up, I would bring along a, an Indian scientist. Uh, a demographer, mm -hmm. hopefully a female. There have been any number of studies in India of women's rights and the participation of women in the economic system and in the political system. And in those places, as a matter of fact, there was one, I forgot the cantons, I forgot what they call their political, like county level. And one, they just threw out all of the government, replaced it with a 50-50 men, women government, and population dropped in that county. So it's not just about having kids, it's about the culture, right? And if, if people from that culture stand up and say, no, 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 there's a different way to do things, then you have impact. I mean, I, you're right. It, me standing up as a you know, white male from the United States ain't going to go very far. I got to have, you know, it's, it's got to be uh, a global message. Yeah. Just going back to what you're saying about the uh, cradle to grave uh, cycling, how do you see that economic transition happening? Ooh. I'm not an economist, and I don't play one on the stage. Um, my, my, my gut sense is that change will come when we have political leaders who are willing to lay it on the line. I think we got very close in the past, but we really haven't had you know, a political leader who made climate change, who's made sustainability his or her message. And they're not going to do that until we, the people, tell them this is our number one priority. If you think that sustainability is your number one priority, and believe me, you ought to be pondering that, um, then you let, your, you let anyone who runs for office know this. And you say, I, you know, here's my laundry list of things I care about. Sustainability is at the top. And you let them know that every time somebody runs for office, this is what I'm going to vote about. And eventually, they get the message. Your power of voting is extraordinary. Use it.
Yeah. Um, <clears throat> for the last 20 or 30 years, we've used a lot of this data as environmental scientists, and that's obviously not working. Um, yeah. How do we how do we approach this as environmental sciences scientists and get to these three goals of sustainability in educating students? I well, I think we're beginning to do this right now. Um, we used to approach this from a, from a science point. It's not just science, right? It's not just physics and chemistry and et cetera. It's sociology. It's economics. It's religion. It is ethics, philosophy, et cetera. You've got to put those things together. I think you guys do that here. We do that at the University of Colorado. We started in 95 environmental studies, not just science, environmental studies with the express goal of seeding as many parts of the U.S. and the world as we possibly could with these little, you know, seeds of sustainability. I think that's what we have to do. You have to approach it differently. My, my education, I, no, I know, no education in politics, no education in economics, no education in communication, public speaking. I mean, for those of you who are on the faculty, you know this. You know, you, you get this wonderful education, you get a PhD or a master's, and what do they do? They parade you in front of a classroom for the first time you've ever spoken you know, in a room like this. And you students don't even know this, but we're scared. That has to change. I'm sorry, I got off on a tangent there. But basically what has to change is you have, we have to think of these things far more holistically. Than we meeting that you were, you had 5% with you. Um, Did you change any hearts or minds? Oh, you know what? I, I'll tell you, I got a very nice email from the president of the university thanking me for coming and said that he was rethinking what he done. I don't know, I haven't talked to him since then. But I got mobbed at the end. A whole bunch of people came, stuck cameras in my face. A whole bunch of people what? Stuck cameras in my face, pretty ugly. Oh, oh. <laughs> I thought you said But I tell you, you know, tomatoes. I'm just sitting there watching the word responsibility pop up on the screen. It's like, <laughs> thank you, God. Divine. <laughs> God. Yeah. This is kind of anecdotal, but I was, I was in Hawaii in January, and I ended up with this picked up double snatch in tennis. Yeah. And it turned out that my opponents were, one guy was a retired surgeon and the other was a farmer from Crookston, Minnesota. They spent most of the match explaining to me that organic foods were poisoning the world's population and that the future rested in hybrid crops and gene manipulated products. How does one discuss these things with people with these attitudes? Um, my, my, okay. We were talking about this dinner. There, there's a, a wonderful study called Six Americas that takes a look at how Americans think about climate change. They've done this for other, for GMOs, etc. What you're going to find is about 15% of Americans, you're not going to change their mind. They are, it doesn't matter what you say, it doesn't matter what happens. They're, they're, they believe rather than have a science, scientific thought about it. You're not going to change it. So maybe your tennis folks, you couldn't do anything. But they, believe me, for every one of those, there's a couple of other people out there who are curious that you can talk with, and you can change your mind. Focus on the ones you can change your mind. Uh, we're going to have one last question. Sir. I was going to mention that because I went to these discussions, the same thing. And like you say, it, it's a belief. I actually wanted to get them to come, come along with me tonight and come over to People, I don't believe in that climate change stuff, and I, I, you know, I didn't even, didn't even argue. But I, I feel that, that you know, you, oftentimes, even if you talk to your legislators and representatives in Washington, St. Paul, and even locally, you oftentimes can't have too much of an influence. But what you do yourself, I mean, I heard somebody blow their bike. I looked outside, how many bikes were here, and I, uh, uh, when I was walking up. I'm looking at, at, the, at the lawns and, and how we uh, use fertilizer and, and the, the, the silly way, way, ways we do it. I mean, you can use bacteria to, to fix your nitrogen or you can use fossil fuel. Or you can, uh, you know, all these little things that you can do even when it comes to water, your rainwater collection system, your, uh, uh, how you, how you, these little habits that, that you can change a little bit at a time. 
And, and it, it, it just, and I oftentimes tell people that, you know, I can convert people. I'm asking, okay, you can have a garden this year, and, you know, this, this type of thing, because just the little things that you do, I mean, granted, you're digging the dirt to be a little bit dirty when you just got off of this stuff when somebody said, that oh, climate change is so much political stuff. No, maybe it is, but, uh, you know, I'll get out a little bit of therapy. Uh, and I think that's where we can make the most effect, is, is what you do in your own life. And hard to argue with that. By the way, climate change is all a bunch of bunk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening.